so the next speaker I want to introduce um, is a gentleman I met yesterday. His name's James Steele. And the title of his speech is, There's No Such Thing as Cardio. Um, I met James yesterday. We shared a cocktail together. Awesome dude. Um, really down to earth. And I've been really looking forward to his talk. So I'm, uh, I'm excited. I, I hate cardio. So we'll see. <laughs> I can't wait to hear that there's no such thing. Um, he's a returning speaker to the Tony One Convention. Um, he's also an exercise scientist from Southampton Solent University. Um, he's getting his PhD, and he's an associate lecturer specializing in exercise phys physiology and biomechanics. Um, he's also a published author with another excellent speaker here at the 21 convention. You guys may have heard his talk online, uh, Doug McGuff. So he's a published speaker uh, with Doug and some of his other colleagues. Um, in various peer-reviewed journals. So I'm really excited to uh, hear what James has to say. Welcome him up. Thanks, Robert. I'm going to set my stopwatch so I can try to stick to time. So there we go. Let's set the water. OK, guys. What I'm going to talk to you about today is a an unconventional topic. Maybe not for some of you who have seen Doug's talk and uh, are familiar with some of the kind of thoughts in the area, um, but certainly for me, uh, in my sphere, the academic world, this is a very unconventional topic. Uh, and it's really exciting for me to come to talks like this, where I'm used to talking at you know, academic conferences, lecturing to PhDs and MDs and whatnot, um, and lots of scientists sitting in a room going, oh, yes, that's very interesting, that's very interesting. Um, but it's good for me to come to these talks because I actually get to speak to the people who are going to take these ideas and apply them and actually use them in practice rather than just thinking about the theory and thinking, yes, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so what I want to do to start off with is just give you a bit of background as to how the idea developed uh, a bit of what I've done over the years that um, has brought me into the production of a, uh, this unconventional paper um, that I'll talk you through for the remainder of the talk. So I started off, um, how many years ago now, five years ago doing an undergraduate degree in sport and exercise science um, at Southampton Solent University where I am now. And about around that time, I started to get introduced to um, the concepts of uh, high-intensity resistance training. Up until that point, I was a typical gym rat in the gym, sort of five, six days a week, three-hour sessions at the time, you know. I uh, was in there for so long that I couldn't train hard. I was just training with a really high volume, and I wasn't really uh, thinking about it in a logical or a scientific manner. I was kind of going with what the muscle magazines told me to do, you know. I was doing lifting loads of weights, loads of sets, loads of reps, um, doing my cardio, which we're going to talk through today. Um, and it wasn't until I actually came to the university that I started to think about these ideas. What? A little bit louder. All right. Um, it wasn't until I started to come to university um, to study this uh, sports science and exercise science degree that I started to think about things in this way. Um, and around that time, I got introduced to uh, Arthur Jones's works and um, his ideas that uh, resistance training was just as effective for improving your cardiovascular fitness as um, traditional cardio exercises are. And so for, you know, the last five years, I've been chewing the fat on that idea. And his idea kind of made sense to me, you know, uh, intuitively, but I hadn't really seen any of the kind of hard evidence, the peer-reviewed uh, research um, to support the idea. It just kind of, it kind of made sense. Um, so throughout my degree, I, um, you know, I kept that idea in mind and had the opportunity to work with various different athletes and try to apply the idea and at the same time start to look at some of the research that had been done um, that actually either did or did not support the idea to see whether or not you know, I was actually applying an evidence-based practice to these athletes. Um, so during my second and third years of my degree, I got the chance to work with um, an Ironman triathlete, uh, an international athlete. If for those of you who don't know what the Ironman is, it's an it's a ultra-endurance event. It's kind of one of those pinnacle events for endurance athletes. Um, and I got to work with him and start to apply these principles. And uh, it was a foreign concept to him, you know, minimal high intensity resistance training, training once or twice a week, single sets taken to momentary muscular failure, really intense stuff, but really low volume, really low frequency. Um, 
And while I was doing that, I had to write up reports and whatnot to um, hand into my lecturers uh, to evidence what I was doing and uh, you know, show that I had an understanding of the research and that what I was doing was actually supported. Um, so I started looking for the research in the area and getting you know, little bits here and there, starting to piece them together, looking at different measurements that we take of cardiovascular fitness, things like VO2 max, and which is the maximum amount of oxygen your body can uptake and utilize during exercise, uh, things like economy of movement, which is uh, you know, how efficiently you actually perform exercise at an absolute workload, and things like lactate threshold, which is uh, how well your body deals with uh, the production of lactate and its removal. And I started looking at studies and finding that um, you know, some of them showed that these things improved with resistance training, and some of them didn't. Uh, and it was really hard to kind of like gather you know, what the consensus was. There were various reviews uh, done by you know, prominent exercise physiologists in the area, um, which kind of you know, made the suggestion that you know, strength training, resistance training, it's good for cardiovascular fitness or measurements of cardiovascular fitness, um, and it's useful for some athletes but it's never going to be as good as traditional cardio training. And so I kind of went through and finished my degree with that in mind, thinking, you know, that maybe the evidence is just lacking, you know, there's contradictory bits here and there, and it's hard to kind of tease out what the real conclusion is. So I kind of went along with that. Um, it wasn't until last year, or the year before actually, um, that my colleague, who was going to be here today, but unfortunately he's not uh, around, um, James Fisher, came to me and uh, suggested that we start to put together a uh, academic paper on resistance training recommendations. So um, for any of you, uh, are any of you heard of the American College of Sports Medicine? It's one of the kind of big sports medicine and exercise medicine, uh, exercise science organizations. And they publish a position stand on resistance training, which is supposed to be a uh, unbiased review of all the evidence in the area um, and give recommendations to athletes and uh, the general public to apply. Um, unfortunately that position stand over the years, is, it's come through various different uh, reviews and editions so to speak and it's received a lot of heavy criticism um, for falsifying information, uh, misciting evidence, citing evidence that doesn't support their beliefs etc etc and um, we had a look over all the evidence and um, tended to agree with the criticisms. So we said to ourselves, well, why don't we write a paper that acts as a position stand? Because at that point, all the criticisms didn't really nail everything down and give people a set of recommendations to actually take and apply. So we thought, why don't we write our own kind of position stand on it? So last year, we published this uh, paper, Evidence-Based Resistance Training Recommendations, which um, you can get a hold of on my blog, or um, which I'm sure Anthony will put the link on the uh, web on the 21 Convention when the video is posted up. And um, for those of you here, it's uh, jamessteelii.blogspot.com, um, and I just write about all sorts of stuff on there when I've got the time to. It's not just uh, exercise. Um, and while we were writing this paper, I, uh, or when we started to plan out the paper, I suggested, you know, why, why don't we, if we're, you know, going to spend all this time reviewing all the research and looking at what, uh, you know, the actual research findings suggest, why don't we take this idea of, you know, resistance training's effect on cardio and add it in? Uh, and James and, and my other, uh, the other authors on the paper, who are my PhD supervisors, um, thought it was a great idea. And so I said, I took that task on board. So I started writing that section of the paper. So I started searching all the databases and uh, PubMed and Google Scholar and whatnot, finding all the evidence I could and um, was really starting to get kind of blown away by it. And the section grew and grew and grew and grew and grew until it was pretty much the same size as the rest of the paper on its own. Um, so we decided to pull it out and look at publishing it as its own independent article. But one of the important things that came from uh, taking both papers was in our evidence-based resistance training recommendations paper, we uh, tried to define uh, exercise intensity or specifically resistance training intensity more appropriately because up until that time, um, most researchers and academics and uh, practitioners in the area uh, tended to misdefine uh, exercise intensity. They often use, um, does everyone know what a one repetition max is? Hands up, everyone know what that is? Yeah. Okay, so the most weight you can lift in, in any particular exercise movement or resistance training movement uh, for one repetition and no more. So um, most of the time people recommend resistance training loads as a percentage of that amount. Um, 
but often they misappropriately uh, define intensity as being a relative percentage of this load, when really all it is is, is load. Um, someone could do one repetition at 80% of their one repetition max, and someone could do 100 repetitions at 50% of their one repetition max. The numbers don't really add up there. But, um, but the assumption would be that if we were using percentage of repetition max as a definition of intensity, the person doing 100 repetitions with 50% of their one rep max would be working at a lower intensity than the person who did one repetition at 80% of their one repetition max. Louder. So it, we, we felt that, that most authors were you know, misusing this term. And so we tried to more appropriately define it as being um, intensity in exercise is more representative of the effort you put in. So by definition, there can only be two measurements, really, of exercise intensity. Everything else in, in the middle is, is pretty hard to define objectively. Um, so you, you've got 100%, you work as hard as you can. You perform as many repetitions under the same conditions as you can, and that's your 100% of your intensity. And at the other end, you've got nothing, which is 0%. Anything in the middle is really hard, certainly at the moment, to actually measure and define. And taking this idea, I started to apply it to the research I was looking at uh, in the area of uh, resistance training and cardiovascular uh, fitness. And it became clear to me that the reason that it was really hard to kind of pinpoint a, um, you know, a consensus or, or, or whether or not it was or wasn't beneficial was because most research had uh, misappropriately defined uh, intensity. They had used load as uh, a measurement of in, or as a definition of their intensity and that was why it was really hard to actually pull this out and the other reviews and uh, recommendations uh, up until that point hadn't act, uh, appropriately accounted for that so I went back over the research and said to myself right the, the, the most important thing is to make sure that I differentiate between the studies that have controlled intensity I had their participants perform resistance training to momentary muscular failure to their maximum and those that haven't appropriately controlled for that. And after doing that, I started to realize that there was a trend in the, uh, in the results of those studies when you differentiate it between the two. Um, and that's what I'm going to go through today and talk to you about, you know, what, what affects um, controlling for intensity and, and the fact that intensity is really the most important aspect of it. So, you know, traditionally and for the last 30 years or so, um, the concept of aerobic exercise you know, came about in the 70s when oh, Ken Cooper came up with his aerobics idea um, with the, uh, the notion that one form of exercise could isolate uh, aerobic metabolism and, then, and that would be beneficial for cardiovascular health and cardiovascular fitness. And over the years, it's really hard to pinpoint how it's kind of actually evolved, but somehow aerobics has turned into, you know, cardio and most people think of uh, what was traditionally labeled aerobic exercise long slow sessions on bikes treadmills rowing machines whatever all these typical cardio machines that you see in the gym uh, it, it kind of evolved into anything done on any of those machines or jogging outside swimming cycling etc that was labeled as cardio and that was what you had to do to improve your cardiovascular fitness or cardiovascular health um, and there was this kind of false dichotomy that arose between cardiovascular training or cardio training and uh, resistance training. One was for your cardio, and everyone said that you have to do your cardio training to improve your cardiovascular fitness. And if you want to improve your strength, your power, etc., you had to do resistance training. And you had to do two separate programs. But as I'm going to show you, that's not the case. So we... Is that on? Put it at that. How do I move on? Do you want to skip it? The bottom one? Ah, there we go. Cool. Okay. So, a couple of weeks ago, we finally had this paper published. So, we've re we, uh, myself, uh, James Fisher, Stuart Bruce Lowe, and Dave Smith, my two PhD colleagues, uh, and uh, Doug McGuff, who Robbie's uh, spoke about, who presented a couple of years ago and is going to be speaking in Austin again, um, we started putting together all this research and writing this paper with the idea that hopefully we can introduce this idea to the academic world and start to get researchers actually properly controlling variables and, and you know, producing research that actually we can draw sensible conclusions from rather than trying to tease out all these different conclusions from really poorly controlled studies. So, 
<coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through just two of the diagrams that we've put in the uh, paper. I'm not going to go through all the individual studies that I've reviewed because there's a 150 odd papers referenced in there um, and if you want to go through and actually look through our, my discussion of the uh, of the actual research and their methodologies and whatnot you can get the paper it's freely accessible online um, you can download a PDF and, and have a read through the whole thing um, but what I'm going to talk through is the uh, diagrams which just kind of like conceptualize these ideas for you and allow you to think about it so if I go back quickly um, will that go back there we go so what I tried to uh, differentiate between uh, in this was, um, first of all, what effect does resistance training have on cardiovascular fitness measures, so like VO2 max, running economy, lactate threshold, when intensity is properly controlled for? Um, and then what actual physiological uh, uh, you know, responses or adaptations actually produce those improvements in cardiovascular fitness? So we broke the paper down into introducing the concept, um, defining intensity, and then going through and looking at what happens in the body whilst we're training intensely using resistance training, um, and what adaptations happen over a period of time if we actually employ a training program using that. Um, so we'll start off by looking at the oh, wrong way at the acute responses. Can everyone see the diagram that well? Uh, the writing might be quite hard to read. I'll talk you through it, through it anyway. OK, so to start off with, we thought about muscular contraction and we appropriately applied the definition of intensity that we propose in there. So by its nature, if you're going to appropriately control for intensity, you have to perform resistance training to momentary muscular failure. You have to perform as many reps as you can with whatever load it is you're using. And we then broke down the responses we looked at into the metabolic responses, the uh, molecular responses, and the, the actual cardiovascular responses as a whole. When we think of the cardiovascular system, the measurements of cardiovascular fitness that we get are a product of all these different things. Um, but the cardiovascular system is inherently the heart and the uh, vascular system itself. So we broke down what was happening at the muscular level, i.e. the metabolic and the molecular components and the cardiovascular components, which were the uh, vascular and the myocardial, or the heart responses. So <clears throat> the first thing we started to look at was what is the oxygen cost of uh, resistance training to, to uh, momentary muscular failure? So traditional recommendations are if an exercise is going to improve your cardiovascular fitness, you need to achieve a certain percentage of your VO2 max during it. So if we got you doing on a treadmill running at 80% of your VO2 max uh, and measured the oxygen that you were using, it should be roughly about 80% of what your measured VO2 max is. Uh, and recommendations are usually anywhere from sort of 70 to 80% in most physiology textbooks and uh, review papers that you'll look at. Um, on the contrary, though, more recent review has shown that actually the actual relative percentage of VO2 max is, uh, is not important. Um, and one of the problems with that is, if you look at the paper, is that most people measure whole body VO2 max instead of looking at the oxygen cost of the actual muscles that are working. So what we did was we tried to uh, take the studies that have looked at resistance training to failure and those that have not controlled for it properly. Um, and one of the problems with uh, the oxygen cost responses are is that most of the studies are all over the place. So what we found was that most studies uh, didn't in or included rest periods and all these other things and gave false impressions of a really low oxygen cost percentage um, during resistance training, even when it was taken to fatigue because they hadn't controlled their methods properly. So just eyeballing the research in that area, you would get the impression that, oh, well, if you take the assumption that you need a high percentage of your VO2 max to improve your cardiovascular fitness, then resistance training provides a really poor stimulus to that. But again, that's, that's a huge assumption. Um, so what we started to look at instead was to try and break it down into well, what's actually happening metabolically when we train the muscle really intensely. And um, the reason I got Doug involved on the paper is because although I had kind of, you know, had these ideas brewing in my mind for a number of years and, um, you know, I kind of had a basis for conceptualizing them, 
Doug's book, uh, Body by Science, really kind of uh, pinpointed it and uh, gave me a kind of framework to think about it in, especially with regards to the actual metabolic responses that go on. So most of the time when we think of uh, metabolism during exercise, um, you can roughly break it down into, you've got your anaerobic metabolism, which is energy production in the absence of oxygen, and you've got your aerobic metabolism, which is any produ energy production in the presence of oxygen. Now, most exercise recommendations will, again, draw this kind of false dichotomy between the two. Uh, they'll say there's a kind of um, spectrum that if you're working at a very low intensity, you're working aerobically. If you're working at a high intensity, you're working anaerobically. So if you're working anaerobically, you can't improve your aerobic or your cardiovascular fitness. Um, and if you're working somewhere in between, then you might be able to get the best of both worlds. But what that does is it avoids the fact that anaerobic metabolism actually feeds in to, uh, just broke my pointer, um, feeds into the anaerobic processes. So I would recommend actually purchasing a copy of Body by Science and going through the diagrams in there because it presents it very well and the, the paper um, it goes into a lot more uh, detail in terms of the biochemistry, um, or having a look at Doug's presentation next year. But basically, the, bi the end products of anaerobic metabolism have to enter the mitochondria, which is the part of the cell that does aerobic metabolism. Um, and that's how aerobic metabolism works. Anaerobic metabolism feeds into it. So even at this other end, when you're working predominantly aerobically, as they say, you've still got anaerobic processes going on. At the other end of the spectrum, when you're working maximally anaerobically, your aerobic system will be running maximally as well. The only difference is the proportion of energy that each is providing. So at the end of the spectrum, both anaerobic and aerobic metabolism will be working maximally, but anaerobic metabolism can ramp up and increase the no amount of energy it provides exponentially compared to aerobic metabolism. Aerobic metabolism has a, a limiter on it, basically. There's an enzyme that limits the amount of uh, this end product from aerobic, anaerobic metabolism, uh, the rate at which it can enter the mitochondria, and uh, therefore the rate at which you can you know, aerobically metabolize and uh, produce energy. So what you have is, uh, Working at maximal intensity, you have a maximal stimulus to your anaerobic metabolism and a maximal stimulus to your aerobic metabolism. And that seems to be limited by this enzyme. So as long as you're working the local muscles maximally, so let's take, for example, uh, you're performing a leg extension exercise. Exercise physiologists love leg extension exercises in research just because it's really easy to control and most labs have a leg extension machine. So let's say you perform repetitions to failure. Your, if we were to measure your VO2 max, i.e. the amount of oxygen you're taking in and using for aerobic metabolism, it would appear to be relatively low if we compared it to your whole body VO2 max. So let's say, for example, we did a VO2 max test on a treadmill. We got you to run until you pretty much collapsed and measured the maximum amount of oxygen you could take in. The problem is you're comparing apples and oranges, because in the leg extension exercise, you're measuring the maximal aerobic metabolism or the maximal oxygen consumption being used by the muscles in that exercise. And you're then comparing it to the maximal amount of oxygen that you can take in and utilize when you're using loads of other muscles as well. So what's actually happening is, although relatively, if you compare it to your VO2 max on, say, a treadmill or a bike, um, it would appear you're using a very low percentage of oxygen, you're actually working those muscles maximally in terms of their oxygen consumption. So that provides a really strong stimulus to the aerobic components of, uh, of the muscle there. <clears throat> what you've also got then is as you start to work maximally, um, the products of anaerobic metabolism can't enter the mitochondria as quickly as they would like to. They start to stack up in the cell and something's got to be done with them. So they get converted to lactate essentially for a variety of, uh, for a, a series of uh, biochemical reactions. And that lactate can start to interfere with uh, muscular performance and contraction. So the body's got to try and deal with that, otherwise it will start to inhibit the amount of uh, work you can do. And another thing that um, can start to improve your endurance performance and your cardiovascular performance is an increase in your body's ability to deal with that. Now this is one of the areas that has not actually been a great deal of research being done on. So some of the stuff we suggest in the paper is speculative and does suggest that more research needs to be done on it. But it does appear that you can start to improve uh, your lactate threshold, as we call it, uh, the body's ability to take those byproducts and deal with them 
uh, more efficiently through performing resistance training to momentary muscular failure again. So all of these different things uh, that we look at on the metabolic side of things are all being maximally stimulated when we work a muscle to fatigue. It doesn't matter what the mode of exercise is. It doesn't matter whether you're doing, you're on a bike and you're doing sprints until you can't move the pedals anymore, or if you're on a leg press and you're doing repetitions until you can't move the weight anymore. It's all the same at the metabolic level, at that physiological level. One of the other really important findings that uh, I came across was uh, some of the molecular goings on at that level. Now, uh, this is a really interesting and, and recently emerging area of research. Um, in, in 2005, there was a, a study done um, which came up with uh, an idea of what they call the AMPK-PKB switch. And I'll, tr I'll try and avoid using too much jargon, but uh, essentially um, what they found out was there are two different metabolic pathways that stimulate either improvements in the physiology that underpins your cardiovascular fitness or the physiology that underpins your muscular strength and uh, performance in that respect. And this study was done on rats. So great, we can extrapolate those findings to humans as we all love rat studies, especially in exercise and nutrition. Um, but one of the problems was, again, it wasn't properly controlled. They used really poor uh, representations of exercise. Uh, uh, they didn't control for the intensity appropriately. And they compared what they noted was cardio exercise and resistance training exercise and suggested that there was, under resistance training exercise, an increase in this pathway, they call it mTOR, that increases uh, protein synthesis and increases the amount of muscle you have. Um, and in the cardio exercise, there was an increase in this AMPK activity, which um, is supposed to increase uh, the, the, or uh, adapt uh, your physiology to be able to you know, induce aerobic adaptations and improvements in cardiovascular fitness. Um, so this study was published in 2005, and as most organizations and prominent researchers do, they jump on these new concepts and go, oh, look, this proves our preconceived notions that resistance training and cardiovascular training are dichotomized, that you know, uh, resistance training doesn't do anything for cardiovascular fitness. So predictably, loads of review papers came out, and they said, oh, look, you know, this, this further shows that you, know, you can't get the same adaptations from it. Had they waited a you know, a few more months, they would have realized that there was actually a paper done in humans that actually disproved that idea. Um, and what they found was that by performing resistance training intensely to that point of failure, where we're maximally stimulating these metabolic processes, what happens is, is uh, the body uses a molecule called uh, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, um, as its kind of universal currency for energy. So all the met metabolic processes that go on are used to resynthesize ATP so that we can then break it down and use it for muscular contraction and various other metabolic pr uh, uh, processes. Um, so what happens when we start to uh, work maximally is ATP starts to get broken down and used up quicker than we can produce it. And what the body does is it breaks it down from ATP to a molecule called ADP and then a molecule called AMP. Uh, and it's just tri di m as it removes phosphate molecules. Um, and what you get is if you work the muscle really intensely is the ratio of ATP to AMP starts to change. So what happens is, is the amount of AMP goes up significantly and the amount of ATP goes down considerably. Um, so you get this change in this ratio, and this is what actually stimulates this AMPK pathway, which up until this point, researchers have been saying it's only associated with cardio exercise, and it's what produces cardiovascular adaptations. But what these researchers found was that as long as you perform intense resistance training, AMPK is actually activated, because what's happening is your AMP to ATP ratio is increasing significantly. So it's stimulating that metabolic pathway, which is thought to, uh, to actually lead to changes in the physiology that will improve cardiovascular fitness. Now, what they also found was resistance training in the first sort of two, three hours after intense resistance training, AMPK was up through the roof, comparable to cardiovascular exercise. Cardio exercise. I'll remember to keep using my quotation marks. Um, it went through the roof. But then after about three hours, it started to slowly come down. And this mTOR pathway started to come up again. So we saw that after a period of time, both pathways were being stimulated through 
intense resistance training, which would suggest that actually there is the potential, if we assume that these molecular pathways are actually responsible for those adaptations, for resistance training to produce cardiovascular fitness improvements and strength improvements as well. So that's kind of what goes on at the muscular level in terms of the responses. What happens at the cardiovascular level, though, is thinking on more of a gross scale. So it's what's happening in the, in the vasculature, in the arteries and the uh, veins and the capillaries and whatnot during exercise, and what's actually happening in the heart. Now, some of the research in this area, in the vascular area, sorry, is, is limited. Um, but what we do know is that, kind of intuitively, you would expect it anyway. The more intensely you start to work a muscle, the more progressively intensely you contract it, the more blood flow increases to that area, which seems reasonable because the body wants to get more oxygen there, wants to remove waste products, um, and it wants to you know, try and support that area that's being used uh, intensely. So what you see is there's an increase in blood flow. Now what happens when we increase blood flow through an a, uh, artery is that what we call the shear stress, or the amount of stress that's been put on the walls of the artery, increases significantly. Uh, we get a huge increase in peripheral blood pressure, so around the muscles that are being worked, blood pressure goes through the roof because the muscles are contracting, squeezing against the veins and arteries, and um, what happens is, is you've got this huge peripheral stimulus to this huge stress to the peripheral vasculature. Um, what actually happens though, as the muscles start to contract intensely, is although blood pressure significantly increases at the periphery, at the muscles being worked, we get an increase in what's called venous return. So your arteries take blood away from the heart and take it to the rest of the body and the veins return it back to the heart. And what happens is, is as the muscles intensely contract, it kind of pumps and squeezes the, uh, the veins and returns that blood to the heart a lot more efficiently. Um, now for years there's been a, uh, again, another preconception that because of observational research where people have looked at bodybuilders and powerlifters and then looked at endurance athletes um, and found that there are differences in their heart physiology, um, there's been the assumption that it's because of their training protocols as opposed to them selecting their sports because of their differences in physiology. Um, so the idea has always been that Resistance training increases the size of your heart. It causes a kind of hypertrophy effect, the same as it would do on your muscles, to the actual heart muscle. And the belief was because of the increased blood pressure that was uh, shown during resistance training. Problem is, usually when we measure blood pressure, we measure it at the periphery. So we'll measure it using a brachial cuff on the arm. Um, in rare cases, they'll measure it uh, using a... Um, a cuff on the leg, but usually on the arm. So it doesn't really give us a representation of what's actually going on in the heart during exercise. Now, there have been studies done which have actually measured the pressure in the heart during intense resistance exercise. And surprise, surprise, there's little to no change. So the heart doesn't actually experience that much in the way of stress as compared to the peripheral vasculature during, during intense resistance training. Uh, and partly that seems to be because of the improved return to the heart, this improved venous return through that skeletal muscle pump. Uh, and this shows up as uh, there's no change in the vascular, uh, myocardial pressure, the left ventricle which pumps out blood because it gets more returned into it, the heart can then more efficiently pump blood out. So the heart's efficiency actually seems to increase the harder and harder we train uh, using resistance exercise. This doesn't seem to be the case in traditional cardio exercise though, uh, probably because there's a lack of this skeletal muscle pump action. But what we do get is obviously we get an increase in the amount of blood that the heart's pumping out. So it pumps faster, it pumps harder, it pumps more efficiently, and we get an increase in heart rate and an increase in cardiac output. Now, when I move on in a second to the adaptations that actually occur because of all these uh, stimuli, the adaptations in the heart are relatively poorly uh, researched. Um, and one of the things we've got is, we do know that this doesn't seem to have much of an effect on adaptations, but there may be an effect of this increase in heart rate. Just by raising your heart rate, there may be some sort of stimulus to the heart. But as we'll see, that doesn't seem to necessarily be the case. So that's generally what seems to happen when we're doing resistance training. The actual physiological responses that occur 
at the muscular level and partly at the, cardio at the uh, gross cardiovascular level are really not that much different than what happens when we do traditional cardio. So the question is, that may happen you know, during exercise, but that doesn't necessarily imply that the adaptations will be the same because there are a host of other things that go on when you're doing resistance training compared to cardiovascular training or cardio training. Um, for example, you've got increased tension on the muscles because of the resistance you're using. Um, but we at least know that some of the responses are pretty similar. And the responses that are similar are the ones that at the moment uh, and what are predominantly evidence to uh, induce those cardiovascular adaptations. So, this is the last slide that I'm going to go through. Just going to go through the adaptations that actually occur that are shown to actually improve your cardiovascular fitness. So, we've taken the graph and let's assume that we're going to uh, perform a training program, getting people to perform high intensity resistance training, and i.e. training to failure each time they perform an exercise. What we're going to assume is happening is all those responses that we just spoke through, they're going to be occurring whilst they're doing the resistance training. When they get to failure, they're going to have an increase in uh, maximal anaerobic, aerobic metabolism, decrease, oh, sorry, increase in AMP to ATP, AMPK is going to be activated, all these different things that are going to be stimulating uh, cardiovascular fitness improvements. So again, what we did is we took each of the components that are thought to improve measurements of cardiovascular fitness uh, and had a look at what was actually happening in terms of the physiology because we had seen that uh, all of these measurements of cardiovascular fitness were improved, but a lot of different things actually constitute to those improvements. So if we take one measurement of, say, for example, VO2 max, there's a whole host of different things going on whilst we measure that, that are contributing to that end result. So what we wanted to do was work back a little bit and actually see what is happening in the body, what physiological adaptations are happening that are improving cardiovascular fitness. So again, we looked at the, oh, wrong one. Is that gonna go back? Yeah, there we go. So we looked at the metabolic, the molecular, and the cardiovascular adaptations. Now, <coughs> Again, what we did was we took the studies that had controlled intensity and the studies that hadn't controlled intensity and compared the results of the two. And consistently, what we found was the studies that had controlled intensity had their participants train to failure as opposed to just training to some arbitrary number of reps, you know, three sets of 10. Doesn't matter what weight you're using, doesn't matter if you could have done 10 more reps, five more reps, whatever. Um, we were looking at the studies that actually had their participants perform as many repetitions as they could. They trained to their maximum. And what we found, interestingly, was in terms of the metabolic responses, there was an increase in every study in terms of the mitochondrial enzymes. So the mitochondria, as I said earlier, that's the part of the cell that performs aerobic metabolism. And there are various enzymes in that part of the cell which perform all the biochemical processes that produce ATP in the presence of oxygen. And what all these studies tended to find was that these enzymes started to significantly increase in the amount that were there. So assuming they're not what we call rate limiting enzymes, i.e. they don't have a maximal cycling rate, the more we get, the more efficiently we're going to be able to actually perform aerobic metabolism. And consistently, every time a study had the participants perform to momentary muscular failure, intense resistance training, there was an increase in mitochondrial enzymes, which is traditionally believed to be associated with endurance activity and cardiovascular fitness. In terms of the molecular things that went on, we also found that studies, again, that had performed resistance training to momentary muscular failure had an increase potentially in the number of mitochondria they had. Now, these studies had a bit of a, a problem in terms of methodologies, again, um, because there was you can have what's called measures of volume or measures of density when you're looking at cellular things. Um, and a lot of studies mistook density for volume. And let's say, for example, you take an absolute volume and you measure the amount of stuff that's in it. Well, if you look at it relative to the absolute volume, then you can say there's a density of da 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 da, -da. Um, If you then go to measure the density again and the absolute volume's increased, but the amount of stuff inside it has stayed the same, it will give you the impression that the amount of stuff might have been reduced because the density, the relative uh, measure of that stuff compared to the volume has decreased. But what's actually happened is when you look at the resistance training studies, at best, or sorry, at worst, 
they have no effect on the number of mitochondria. Some people suggest that resistance training reduces the number of mitochondria because they falsely interpreted this uh, density and volume measurements. Um, but other studies actually show that mitochondria, the number of mitochondria you have increase so you get what's called mitochondrial proliferation which is something that this AMPK molecular pathway controls so and this is a big topic as well because there's a lot of stuff at the moment in terms of um, how important your mitochondria are to your health not only your fitness um, so the idea that you can increase the amount of mitochondria you have produced new mitochondria will mean that you'll be working more efficiently um, and potentially you know you're, you're um, improving your health through that as well you also get a, a change in fiber types. So does everyone know that there are different types of muscle fibers? So uh, on a, a simple scale, you've got your type 1 fibers and you've got your type 2 fibers. Um, you can go into more depth with that and say there are different types of type 2 fibers and you also have intermediary fibers which sit between the two. Um, but you can go on and on and on. Um, but essentially what you've got are your type 1 fibres are what you call your slow twitch fibres and your type 2 fibres are what you call your fast twitch fibres. Uh, and your slow twitch fibres, your type 1 fibres, are generally more fatigue resistant. So they'll be able to go for longer as compared to your type 2 fibres. Now your type 2 fibres, again, with a kind of uh, simplified uh, change between them, you've got what are called type 2 X and type 2A fibers. And your type 2A fibers kind of sit between the two. So they're powerful, like the type 2X fibers, but they're also more fatigue resistant. So they're like fatigue resistant type 2 fibers. Now what happens, again, with resistance training to failure is as you train to failure, over the course of a training program, your type 2X fibers start to change to type 2A fibers. So the fatigue resistance of your type 2 fibers increases and that's predominantly because there's an increase in the number of mitochondria in them so these type 2 x fibers which typically are more fatiguing they decrease or sorry increase their amp to atp ratio more drastically than the other fibers do and this is what stimulates an increase in mitochondria in them and eventually it gets to the point where they've become so fatigued and fatigued over a series of ex uh, of training sessions that that stimulus has induced an increase in the mitochondria in those uh, muscle fibers. So they end up looking like type two fibers. So you end up with a more fatigue resistant muscle as a whole, as well as an increase in strength. <clears throat> okay, you also get an increase in type one fi fibers as well, uh, which has been shown in a couple of studies. Now, the last thing to look at again is this gross cardiovascular improvements because most people when they think of cardiovascular they think of the heart and they think of you know your arteries and your veins and your capillaries um, now as we've shown there doesn't seem to be that much of a stimulus to the heart and the training studies actually tend to support that there doesn't seem to be much in the way of an adaptation in the heart. The problem is most of the training studies have been really poorly done, really poorly controlled. Uh, in fact, there are very few training studies being done. Uh, I was alerted to a recent one um, a couple of weeks ago, which I hadn't had the chance to uh, look through yet, um, to see whether or not they have appropriately controlled intensity, because it's always the first thing I look at now when I look at the study. Um, so when, when we wrote this paper, we, we weren't aware as to whether or not there were any adaptations. And certainly looking at the uh, acute responses in terms of the heart during exercise, there didn't seem to be any stimulus to actually induce changes in the heart. But what was happening was, again, more things were happening at the peripheral level, so the muscles and uh, the local support to the muscles was being improved significantly. Now, what you've got coming from the heart, are you've got main arteries uh, which lead out to the rest of the body, um, but as you get closer and closer to the individual cells, they get smaller and smaller into capillaries, and it's these capillaries that really actually allow for transport of uh, oxygen and various different products uh, into and out of the cells. Uh, and what happens is, is if you get more capillaries, then you've got a greater uh, surface area for actually that transport to occur. So what seems to actually happen, and again it seems to be controlled maybe by this AMPK uh, molecular pathway, is you get an increase in the number of contacts of capillaries, so you get what's called a capillari capillarization, you get more capillaries being produced at that muscular level. So not only is the muscle improving, but the actual support structures to the muscle are being improved as well, which allows 
more oxygen to be delivered to that area. So you're not only increasing your ability to utilize oxygen in the muscle, but you're actually increasing the amount of oxygen that can be transported to it. So you get an increase in the number of capillaries leading to all of these uh, muscle fibers, um, and you get an increase in the cap capillary to fiber ratio. So you get more capillaries to each fiber. So not only do you have, say, for example, one fiber and one little capillary just feeding that fiber, you get loads of capillaries just funneling uh, products into that muscle. Now, all of these physiological adaptations, we think are what's responsible for these improvements in cardiovascular fitness. So to conclude, what we kind of suggested in this paper is, OK, well, for years and years and years, there's been this dichotomy between strength training and endurance, cardio, aerobics, whatever you want to call it. And that seems to be false. Most people, like uh, Robbie said, don't enjoy cardio. Most people don't enjoy going out and running miles and miles and miles and miles. Um, but they're unaware that they can produce the same effects by training once, twice a week for at most 10, 15 minutes, just working really hard by doing resistance training. Now, there are some people who enjoy running, enjoy cycling, enjoy swimming, um, and that's fine. They can go out and do them. But the important thing for me is to uh, convey the message that if the objective of you performing exercise is to improve a particular aspect of your fitness, uh, your cardiovascular fitness, say, for example, then would you not want to do that in the most efficient and time uh, time efficient po uh, way possible and also the safest way possible because intense resistance training when it's properly conducted is safer than long slow high impact repetitive cardiovascular training as it's typically performed now that doesn't mean to say that athletes sh who are endurance performers should exclusively be doing this type of training and it's something that we make very clear in the paper you know if you're an athlete and you're running marathons just doing resistance training doesn't mean you're going to be able to perform at your best in terms of that sport. Because not only does all of this stuff contribute to your sport, but there are a whole host of other things. The skill in terms of your efficiency of running, um, psychological factors, various other things as well. So by no means does this mean that doing this is the be all and end all in terms of sporting performance. But it is the same as traditional cardio training in terms of the everyday Joe can uh, improving his cardiovascular fitness to make him be more fatigue resistant and more endurable to deal with his day-to-day -day activities or the sport he plays at the weekends or you know a couple of evenings during the week um, it's not going to make you an elite athlete but it's going to produce the same physiological adaptations in significantly less amount of time and improve your strength as well so that for me I think is, is the most important factor. It's trying to get people to stop wasting their time when they could be doing something uh, far more effective or far more efficient, um, just as effective and improve other aspects of their fitness as well. Thank you all for listening. Um, I'll take any questions now. I think we've got, uh, I think I finished a few minutes early so I've got a little bit of time for questions if anyone's got any. Um, I think we need a mic. Hi, I've come across um, high endurance training with... Um, Sorry, just uh, speak up a little bit. Yeah, I've come across uh, high endurance training um, with boxing, with like yep. a uh, conditioning coach. So I think I've read about it similar before. So in terms of how I apply that in my training routine, um, are you saying that we just need to train to failure? For example, um, I think you gave an, uh, so you mentioned something about leg extensions. Can you just yep. go over that again, very quickly? Okay. So so are you are you a boxer then? Yeah, I do boxing at the moment. Right. Okay. Um, well. Typically, when I, when I work with athletes, I, I, I tend to actually avoid working with athletes nowadays because I, I work with a lot of professional athletes and uh, it's quite difficult to recondition them when they've been so indoctrinated by various coaching folklore. Um, but typically, what I, I, the first thing I try to get people to do is recognise that there's a difference between skill conditioning and 
physical conditioning or, or improving your body, improving your physiology and um, improving your ability to perform certain movements that are associated with your sport. So what I typically uh, tend, to, tend to do is, as an example, I, I've not actually worked with boxers per se, I've worked with um, uh, tie kick boxers before. Um, but I, I always try and get them to uh, plan their training uh, around their skill training, their sports training, around their um, physical training. So instead of trying to do all this kind of like cross training stuff whereby you'll, um, you'll go into a session doing boxing movements, but the intention of the session is to improve your fitness, improve your physiological fitness, um, in, you know, improve or induce these adaptations that are then gonna transfer into your sport. Um, there's a safer and more efficient way to do that. So what I try and get athletes to do is to um, differentiate between the two. So once, twice a week, depending upon their individual recovery and what other activities they're doing that are involved with their sport, is um, go in and do a session that is specifically dedicated to improving their physiological fitness. So doing it in the most efficient way possible, doing it in a way that's measurable as well, because um, that's one of the real benefits of doing simple high intensity training, single sets to failure, is it's very easy to control and measure your progress as you go through. So you know if you're getting stronger. Um, and then, you know, add in the specific sports conditioning you need to do. So if there are specific skills that you need to work on, then you have a session for that. Ideally, if you're gonna be uh, doing skill conditioning and kind of, you know, this idea of sports specific uh, kind of uh, physical conditioning, um, because let's face it, the going 10 rounds in boxing or whatever, um, you know, that's, you can be as fit as you like, but you may not be able to go 10 rounds you know, with Mike Tyson or whatever, um, because your movements are inefficient, because your skill is very poor, so you're wasting energy. Um, psychologically, you're not with it. So you will need to do those sorts of things in your training as well um, to improve the other variables. It just so happens that they also, you know, induce a fitness effect as well, but you're not doing them with the um, explicit objective of improving that. It just happens to be a byproduct, um, which allows you to then go into other training sessions um, which are specifically dedicated to improving your physiological fitness. And then at the end result is you've not tried to amalgamate the two and got a poor result from either. Um, you've done a program which is effective and efficient for this aspect. You've done a program which is effective and efficient for this aspect. Aspect. and then when you come to actually uh, perform your sport you take the best of both worlds and apply it then instead of trying to amalgamate them in a session. Yeah that's kind of the approach I'm taking at the moment like going to the gym like I say maybe twice a week yeah um, and also doing slight circuit training boxing uh, probably about once or twice a week. Well. Um, yeah perhaps I, I wouldn't necessarily um, a lot of the kind of boxing circuit training is uh, is in my opinion a little bit of a waste of time anyway because it's kind of trying to amalgamate the two. Um, I w you know, boxing is a difficult thing to train anyway because the, uh, uh, the most uh, specific you can get in terms of training boxing skill is getting in the ring and fighting someone. Um, you know, sparring is, is not the same as, as fighting with someone. Um, so it, it's difficult to kind of uh, fit that in. Um, I, I, when I was working with them, I was working with a coach and I would do the physical conditioning and um, try to get him to kind of avoid going in with the idea of, okay, I'm gonna do a circuit training session, you know, get them to do some punches and kicks here, little, 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 rotating round things. Um, instead, I would say, right, you know, try and get them working on, you know, whatever it is, you know, a specific uh, movement, uh, a specific skill, you know, in this session, and, and don't try and mix things up because it only confuses the athletes. Does that answer your question? Yep, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I have more question of uh, lower back questions, a bit off topic. Oh, okay, yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> but I guess you're, you're the one to ask it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm doing the high intensity resistance training yep. and I'm now at the moment uh, when I do a leg press, um, the weights I'm pu pushing away are twice and a half my body weight. Okay. So I'm kind of asking what, what, what does it mean for the injury of my lower back, of the risk of injury to the lower back? On a leg press? Yes, on a leg press. Okay, well, depending upon which leg press you're using and uh, how it's set up and how you're actually performing it on there, you should in theory be pushing the load or the load should be going through your your hips and not actually being put through your back um, so uh, as opposed to for example if you're doing a squat where you've got the load 
atop your spine, which, which means that there is a load being transmitted through there. There will inevitably be some tension across the lower back because the, uh, the what we call the foracolumbar uh, fascia, which runs from the kind of hips up, up through the uh, lower back, um, any tension in the hamstrings or in the glutes from performing the leg press will induce a tension in there, um, but there shouldn't be any direct load on there. So, um, I mean, do you get back pain when you're doing the leg press at all? Or, uh, or are you just concerned about whether or not there I'm is any risk? Sure it's not while doing the leg press, but um, I do have like pain, but not, and I don't think it's a pain of injury, but more of uh, uh, speed. Muscle, okay. muscle stress after, after the training, you know, like when you have the. So it feel, feels like there's been some tension and work, work there. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, okay. I'm a bit concerned from, oh, I don't want to injure it. You know? um, it, if it. I always, whenever I'm working with uh, clients, because obviously my, my research at the moment is uh, I, I'm working with people with chronic lower back pain, um, and I, I try to get them to differentiate between um, the feelings of discomfort during and after exercise, DOMS, which we call it, delayed onset of muscular soreness, um, and whether or not there is actually any pain, because most people's pain that they experience if they've got low back pain feels distinctly different to um, what they experience during exercise. Um, so if what, what I would try to do is differentiate between the two. Also, what you've got to consider is um, some of the aches that you get during or after exercise may not be muscular. Um, Bill De Simone's uh, stuff on uh, from moment arm exercise and congruent exercise is really good um, on emphasizing loading the muscles as opposed to loading the passive ligaments, so the bones and the tendons and uh, what not. So sometimes what can happen is, and a lot of people uh, complain of, you know, ache in the back during um, deadlifts or, uh, you know, good mornings or other kind of lower back exercises. Well, the research actually shows that, that any of those exercises are pretty poor at loading and increasing the strength of the uh, lower back muscles specifically. Um, so it's partly speculative, but, but my belief is it's probably more of a tension and, and an ache that you can feel across the, uh, the fascia, the uh, foracolumbar fascia across that area, um, which it, it potentially could in the long term uh, turn into a kind of uh, wear and tear injury. But um, as there's no direct heavy loading going through it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned with uh, you know, a severe injury going, although that doesn't mean that it can't happen. Um, but the more, most important thing is looking at your setup on the leg press and so making sure that the load is being transmitted through your hips as opposed to be going, going through your back. And then you can be sure that any tension you feel in your lower back is most likely due to the contractions from the uh, hamstrings and the glutes. No way. We've got time? Yeah, One uh, more. Cool. Hey. What are your views on uh, training um, with your own body weight versus training with using weights? What are my views on body weight training versus, uh, say, resistance machines or barbells, etc.? Yeah. Any any other methods? Yeah. Um, my views at, at the moment are the the tool you use is far less important than what you do with it. So you, I mean, you can train uh, effectively uh, and produce essentially the same adaptations as you could do um, using the most high-tech tool, tool uh, available, which I'm led to believe by Anthony is the Arcs Fit at the moment. I've yet to, to try it. And, um, so, uh, but the adaptations that you produce, the, the benefits you get from it, as in um, produced from a tra as a training effect, uh, are largely no different between methods as long as you follow the right recommendations and apply those methods uh, to whatever tool it is you're using. And that's something that we um, highlight in our earlier paper from last year in the evidence-based resistance training recommendations is comparisons, for example, between free weights and machines show that there's no real um, difference in strength adaptations, um, as long as you use uh, uh, the right sort of measures to look at that. Um, but there are obviously benefits from using, there's benefits to using body weight exercises, i.e. you don't need to go anywhere to do them special, you don't need to pay for a gym membership or have any high-tech equipment, um, so they're perfect for uh, using, you know, if you're travelling or whatever. Um, in fact, Chris Hycox, a uh, blogger from Conditioning Research, has got a really good book, uh, Hill Fit, which incorporates, you know, simple exercises and the importance is, you know, how you apply those exercises. Um, but... Uh, there are also benefits, you know, from using resistance machines in terms of time efficiency, as compared to uh, free weights, for example, um, and the greater ability to apply a progressive protocol, i.e., to increase the resistance you're using as you improve in strength. Um, 
and also to more accurately measure your progress. Um, and then, you know, that goes all the way to the other end of using, you know, uh, MedEx medical testing equipment where you can, you know, very accurately measure your strength of an isolated musculature to, you know, the real time feedback you get during uh, an OxFit session. Uh, but my, my belief is, is it doesn't matter if you don't have access to, you know, the most high tech equipment. The most important thing is what you, how you uh, use it. Um, if you've got access to really high tech equipment, that, uh, then you know, use it. it, it it's more, uh, uh, a little bit for the novelty as well because I'm a bit of a geek and I like playing with new toys um, just to kind of see what, what they're like. Um, but that's less important than what you actually do with it. No worries. I think that's everything. If anyone else has got any questions, then I'm going to be around for the rest of the day, um, probably till five or six o'clock. So I'm happy to chat with anyone uh, throughout the rest of the day. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank <laughs> you.